Once again, we are back on Pushpalata Learned Life for Reflection Series. Hello, everyone. Happy evening. This is Jude Deva from Pushpalata Vidya Mandir on Pushpalata Learned Life for Reflection Series. I welcome everyone on behalf of Pushpalata Schools. We hope that all are safe and fine with good health. Stay safe and stay healthy. Music is a piece of art that goes in ears straight to the heart. Everybody loves music. Yes. Today we have an expert, an Indian music producer, playback singer, and songwriter, Mr. Siddha, Siddharth Sriram, popularly known as Sid Sriram. Sid Sriram is an Indian music producer, playback singer, and songwriter. He is a versatile singer accomplished in Carnatic music as well as R&B style and a popular playback singer in Tamil, Telugu, and Malayalam movies. His musical skills were nurtured by his mother, Lata Sriram, a Carnatic music teacher in the San Francisco Bay Area. He simultaneously started picking up R&B after graduating from Mission St. Joe's High School in 2008. He joined the Berkeley College of Music and graduated in music production and engineering. Berkeley College of Music is a prestigious college where 123 of Berkeley alumni have received 297 Grammy Awards, Popular Music's highest honor. He won the Filmfare Award for Best Playback Singer for his rendition of Enod Nirundal for the so soundtrack of I 2015, and a lot more awards like Filmfare Award South. He produced his first solo album, Entropy. He continues to perform Carnatic music at Chennai during the music season in December. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, happy to have you on our Pushpalata Learned Live for Reflection Series. And uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, sir. Sure, I'm very happy to be here today. Yeah, I welcome you once again on behalf of Pushpalata Schools and our students and viewers are waiting for your words on the topic, passion plus preparation is equal to achievement. You can take sure. over the session now, sir. Great, thank you so much. So, um. I haven't done a talk like this in a long time, so I felt like I was uh, going back to school in a way and um, preparing for something, uh, a presentation of sorts, but I'm very excited to be here. I hope you are all doing very well uh, and are safe and healthy. Um, at the offset of today's talk, I want to start off by saying that um, I think it's obvious that we are living in unprecedented times. Uh, something that none of us have experienced before. Uh, but with that, I think it's very important to look at silver linings in a time like this uh, and to identify, you know, how can we take this time of, of such great shift and um, focus in on ourselves, introspect, better ourselves. And um, which leads me to the topic of what today uh, today's talk is, and that is actualizing dreams. Um, I want to start off by talking about dreams as in visions for the future. Uh, a very common misconception is that dreaming is easy. Uh, we view dreams as warm and happy, and certainly warmth and happiness are necessary to dreaming for the future. But uh, I think actualizing a dream requires a whole other spectrum and dimension of things. Uh, those things in include uh, extreme hard work, a singular focus, deep awareness of and belief in self, and a constant desire to evolve and grow. Um, I just listed off a whole bunch of things, but uh, what I wanna do is I wanna look back at my own journey and break down the journey, the peaks, the valleys, everything in between. Uh, and from that, you know, dissect the process of actualizing dreams. So the first, I guess, component or phase that I want to dive into is the foundation. Um, identifying who you are, right? Uh, and the question, who am I, is a broad question. I think it's one that we ask, ask ourselves often. Um, and beyond and beneath the first layer, you know, um, take me, for example, I was born in Chennai, 
uh, in the year 1990. Uh, my parents named me Siddharth Sriram. Later, when we moved to the U.S., people started calling me Sid. Uh, and I view these all as um, very important, you know, aspects to who I am, but also uh, I think the first layer. So beyond that first layer, um, who are you? Uh, when I encounter questions that are broad and kind of vast like this one, I, I try to do um, this thing where I break that vast question down into its smaller counterparts, or sorry, the smaller units. Um, so what are the smaller units to the question? Who am I? What is my identity? What makes me who I am? Uh, some of the questions that I've asked myself often is um, what fascinates me? What inspires me? What do I gravitate towards? What makes me feel a very deep sense of joy? What makes me feel a deep sense of pride? Uh, am I aware in the moments that I feel something, you know, a deep fire within myself? Um, how would you describe the environment around you? What do you love about it? What would you want to change about it? So these questions are, again, somewhat general, but just to make it specifically, just to kind of relate it back to my own story, um, I was probably around three or four when I started learning Carnatic music from my mother. Uh, we moved to the San Francisco Bay Area in 92. Uh, I started learning in, in, in 93. Um, and I think, I honestly don't remember back when I was three years old, but I know that immediately I felt a, a deep sense of affinity for the music form. Um, There are certain moments that I can definitely pinpoint though from a little bit later uh, that stood out. And these are moments that really started guiding me towards my purpose and my passion. Uh, one such moment, one of the first moments where I really realized that this was something that uh, was my calling. Uh, I was in fifth grade, I came home from school and it was, Definitely uh, not one of the best days. I don't remember why, but the, it was a long day. I hadn't had the best day at school. I came back home and I, for some reason, and this is not something I normally would do back then, but before doing anything else, before doing homework, before anything else, I sat down and I started practicing Carnatic music. Um, and mind you, I wasn't uh, at the time the most disciplined when it came to practicing. But this moment kind of really changed a lot for me. So I sat down uh, and I started practicing. And through the course of that practice session that lasted about an hour, let's say, um, I identified that I felt way better. You know, the, the days, um, the full day that kind of had accumulated a sense of weight on my shoulders through singing, through practicing that day, uh, I was really able to, um, you know, work through uh, that feeling of weight and release it. Uh, and this was a huge eye opener for me, mainly because I realized that in music, specifically in Carnatic music, I had um, something that I could really give myself to. And uh, it's interesting when you find these intangibles that, um, you know, you can't, until you experience the feeling of connection to something like music or whatever your passion is, you don't really know that it exists in that way. Um, but in that moment, I realized that I had this. Uh, so from that point on, um, I was guided towards my passion. That's one moment. Um, I remember the piece I sang that day too. It was a composition by St. Dagaraja in Kamboji, called Sri Raghuvar, and I'll just sing a little bit. Sri Raghuvar Pramayama Mavashi Raghuvar Pramayama Mama, 
And like that, it goes on. Um, and maybe it's the ragam. This is a ragam combo. Maybe that did something. Uh, but it was a magical moment and one that's etched in my mind forever. Um, the next moment. Uh, whereas this first practice session uh, that was uh, an epiphany for me, whereas that was an active, I was actively participating uh, in kind of finding the passion through that moment. This next one is a little bit more passive. Uh, I was probably around seventh or eighth grade. And I was, again, this is Carnatic music related. I was listening, uh, a friend of the family had given me cassette tapes of uh, the Carnatic music legend, Sri Samanguri Srinivas Iyer. And I had never really listened to his music before. Uh, maybe my ear had not matured enough to really gravitate towards his music, but something about this set of cassettes really just captured my imagination and my heart. Uh, there's one specific composition that he has sung in these tapes. Uh, it's a composition by Nila Kantashivan in Tamar, in Karhara Priya. It's called Navasiddhi Petralu. So um, in Samanguri Srinivasaya's music specifically, you find the sense of abandon uh, and just unbridled joy in how he sings. Uh, he <laughs> obviously had mastered the art form to such a point where he could kind of do whatever he wanted with it. Um, but even with that, he had such heart in his music. Uh, the song, this song goes, Navasiddhi Petralum Siva Bhakti Verum Savi Sambo Navasiddhi Petralum. And again, it goes on. Um, but it's a beautiful piece with a very important meaning. At the time, I didn't fully understand it, but this man sang it with just such passion. And I was hooked uh, from that point on. Besides just practicing and, um, you know, being passionate about performing in front of people or singing. From that point on, I, I really developed a deep sense of passion for listening to Carnatic music, to finding the gems by listening. Um, there's a quick segue at this point. I think um, a really, really important aspect to the foundation, which is what we're talking right now, talking about right now, um, is the balance of input and output. Uh, I think in the foundational phases, when you're discovering your passion, when you are uh, really kind of starting to give yourself to it, it's it's super important to take in information um, and balance that with outputting information or outputting whatever you feel like you want to give to the world. Um, in my case, it's music. So that point in time in seventh grade, when I listened to this piece, and thereafter started listening to a lot of Carnatic music, you know, it became very apparent to me, maybe first on a subconscious level, that taking in a lot of knowledge, taking in information, processing it, thinking on it, marinating on it, and really kind of obsessing over it um, is very key uh, because anytime you're going to create something, anytime you're going to have a vision for the future, uh, you need that well of knowledge, the well of information, and not just taking it in, but also processing it, thinking about it. Uh, you know, Carnatic music coming back to this, and I think um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but Carnatic music is, is a huge, huge component to my journey, to my um, success and where I'm at today. It's a super, super abstract and complex very beautiful and intricate form. Uh, so there was so much for me to keep digging into. And I think that point in seventh grade was my first initial aha moment where I was like, oh, there is an infinite um, ocean of music around me. And if this is something I care so much about, I wanna take in as much of it as possible. I want to um, break it down as much as possible and think about it. Now, next, uh, I must have been probably in the 10th grade now. Um, and, you know, I would watch a lot of Indian movies, Tamil movies growing up, but uh, also American movies. And one movie that really changed my life was the film Ray. 
uh, which is uh, a biopic on the incredible musician Ray Charles. He is a blues soul musician um, and his music had been somewhat an, of an influence on me before this point. But when I watched the film and I saw how he really embodied um, his purpose, his music and how he just gave his life to it, uh, it really changed something within myself. And beyond just that, um, I realized that the form of music that is known as soul music or R&B, rhythm and blues, uh, is very important to me. Um, watching this, I'd already had uh, a love for this form. Um, I realized it probably around when I was around like 10 years old. But at this point when watching this film, it ignited something deeper. Um, there's a song called Georgia on My Mind which is a very popular one by Ray Charles. So listening to this piece, watching the movie and that movie is kind of a, I mean, that song is kind of a theme through the whole film. Uh, I just started becoming obsessed again with this form of music. Uh, you know, Carnatic music had been growing within me, but when I identified this, I found another form that uh, I thought I, I really wanted to give myself to. Um, song from, from that film, George on my mind, it goes, Georgia, oh Georgia, the whole day through, just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind, on my mind. I said Georgia, oh Georgia. No peace I find. Just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. As you can see, stylistically from what I sang before in those two little Carnatic excerpts and in this, they're obviously very different. Um, but I think what I realized early on is that the soul, the soulfulness, the connection to something deeper than just myself or the individual is present in both. Um, so that was another moment that acted as a, a foundational spark. Um, now moving on, I'm just gonna name a few more of these stories and then we'll keep going into diving and digging a little deeper. Um, in 2010, 11, around then, uh, Eyal Rahman sir got the Oscar for Slumdog Millionaire. I was in college at the time, I was at Berkeley. And I was watching this. This was my second year at Berkeley. So I was still kind of figuring out what I wanted to do, how I was going to do it. Um, but watching this man who I idolized from childhood, but beyond that, he's from the same place that, that I'm from, you know, and spoke the same language that I spoke, uh, that my parents spoke. Seeing him so um, humbly, but with a sense of great confidence as well, accept that award on the biggest stage uh, in Hollywood was such a big game changer for me because it instilled in me this idea that representation was important. That, uh, you know, I always knew this, again, at a subconscious level, but at a more conscious level, once watching that, you know, in the days after that, uh, I realized that I've always had this deep, deep sense of pride in where I'm from, in my roots. Um, you know, though we came to the US when I was just one or two years old, I still felt such a strong connection to my home, uh, which was Madras. And, uh, and watching this moment take place made me realize I want to do that. And uh, by that, I don't simply mean win an Oscar or whatever, but I want to be able to represent uh, for other people that have similar backgrounds uh, to what I do that might look like me or uh, share similar narratives or stories. Um, this became a pillar to what I wanted my journey to, to be. Um, the last story I'm gonna kind of touch on is a much more seemingly random, uh, and this happened when maybe it's actually a couple years before the Oscar moment, um, but when I was uh, in 12th, maybe 11th or 12th, 
Um, we were in Tanjaur. Uh, I think we were visiting some temples there. And we're heading back to Chennai, taking the train. It was a late night train. And um, we were sitting on the platform. I was sitting on my suitcase on the platform. It was a super quiet platform. There weren't that many people there. So it was a quiet night. And I was just staring up at the stars. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful, clear night. And uh, I remember feeling a deep sense of wonder staring up at the stars in that specific moment. And I, it must have been a mixture of being in Tanjaur, which is a beautiful place, um, and just looking up at the sky and thinking there is such promise and so much potential just to do anything, you know? Um, and I don't know if I thought this before, but I definitely in that moment embraced the fact that as human beings, I think uh, we are infinite. It's a bit of a cliche, but there's no limit to what we can do. Um, so now just to kind of recap where we're at so far, from these stories, from these different moments, uh, I realized a few very, very important undercurrents that would form the foundation of my journey. Uh, the first one was I very early on internalized that music was uh, a very special thing for me, that it was not just an outlet or something I was good at, but it was going to be uh, my way of making sense of the world around me. Um, so I realized that. Now, digging deeper, uh, I found that Carnatic music was the form that lived in my DNA. Uh, I realized that Carnatic music was home for me. It was home base. Uh, in the soul and R&B form, I found a whole other dimension of my identity. And I think it was important because, as I've mentioned, I was born in India, but grew up in the U.S. And I always kind of felt a bit of a tug of war between these two separate aspects of my identity in uh, identifying the soul R&B genre and really becoming, uh, giving myself to it. Uh, I think I was able to reconcile these differences and form a bridge of sorts. Uh, and I, through the R&B form, I found another aspect and dimension of my identity. And one that allowed me a completely different vocabulary through which I could express myself, uh, understand music and therefore understand the world. Um, and the last, I guess, big, very important undercurrent is, uh, embracing my roots with a sense of deep pride. Um, it was uh, identity crisis, I think is, is uh, just a part of life. I think as, as we grow up through every phase, uh, we are asking ourselves questions. Who am I? Uh, what is important to me? Um, you know, and for me, I'm very, I'm of the belief that finding your roots and taking pride in your roots uh, opens up so many doors when you're asking yourself the questions of who am I, what is my identity? Um, so I would say that all these moments that I've talked about so far, plus countless other ones, um, what they outline are what I call the spark stage of things. Um, and these moments are the moments when you have that initial spark that illuminates an aspect of who you are. Uh, they're very exciting moments uh, because it's almost like you've unlocked a magic trick of sorts. Uh, and I would say that the initial bricks of your foundation are created by these spark moments. By being aware of and Im immersed in these moments, you start to form an outline of who, who you are and what you can grow towards. I think one of the most necessary uh, aspects of this foundational time uh, is making sure you do stuff. You know, you just try things out, explore. You never know what you're gonna gravitate towards unless you're constantly trying different things out um, and exploring the different potentials of your passions. For me, I got pretty lucky and I found music very early on and almost immediately or like very early 
uh, in my journey with music, I realized that this is what I wanted to do with my life. Obviously, there was going to be so many more manifestations of how that could kind of play out. But I knew that this is what I loved and this is what I wanted to give myself to. And I think the process of exploration allows you to find that passion. Um, another thing is that your foundation is constantly going to grow and evolve. As you can see, the stories that I mentioned, they span uh, you know, a range of years. And even to this day, I'm having those aha spark moments where like, oh, I can take this and internalize it and it will become a part of my foundation. It will bolster my foundation. Um, now that random story about me at the Tanjawa train station looking up at the stars, uh, a big thing that I realized in that moment uh, and that I've held on very closely is the sense of wonder and the deep desire to ask questions. Uh, I think so much of life, so much of um, building your dreams, you know, before you actualize them, but really kind of envision them. So much of that is just asking questions about everything all around you. You know, as you ask these questions, you make sense of more of what's happening around you and within yourself. Uh, so this kind of leads me to the next phase of what I wanted to talk about. And the next phase is what I would call uh, the framework phase or building your framework. So the sparks uh, that I mentioned in the first phase, that's just an initial trigger. Um, sparks by nature are fleeting. They come and they're with you one moment and then they're gone. So how do you capture a spark and convert it into something real? So I think the, the biggest, um, the, one of the most important aspects of this process of capturing and uh, realizing a spark into something real uh, is uh, the idea of building blocks. Uh, smaller units make up a whole. This is just a, a simple you know, statement and fact. Um, so now that you've kind of started to identify what your passion might be, what you're into, whether that be music, architecture, sciences, whatever, um, I think it's very, very important to start looking at whatever the umbrella of your passion is and breaking it down into smaller units. Um, I want to dive into uh, the idea of building blocks a little bit more as it applies to me and as it has applied to my whole journey. Um, as a vocalist, uh, my mom, as I said, started teaching me in 93. Uh, one thing that she was always a stickler for from the very beginning is what we call open-throated singing. Um, and another thing that was very, very, uh, was required by her, and she was a super strict teacher. She's my guru to this day. And, um, you know, we have many conversations. Back then it was more her just kind of making sure I practiced and, and didn't uh, goof around too much. But open-throated singing and pitch. Uh, so the idea of pitch is, is just... Um, it's called in, in Carnatic music, it's called Shruti, but it's the, the note that centers around what you'll sing, the tonic note, the bass note. Uh, and singing in Shruti, singing in pitch is probably for a vocalist, the most important first step. You have to be able to hold a note and it has to resonate where that note exists. So let's take, uh, here, I'll play a note on the synthesizer real quick. <laughs> So this is D. So if I sung it like, obviously it doesn't sound good and also you're not singing in Shruti. So that's a simple concept of Shruti pitch. Open throat singing, using your full voice. Um, Carnatic music is a form where you don't have what they call falsetto or head voice. You only really are supposed to use your chest voice and the full kind of um, uh, spectrum of power that 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 it that it can exhibit. Uh, she realized early on that I had a powerful voice, one that could really um, throw. So there was never a point in time where I was allowed to sing like ah, ah, where you my mouth is basically closed. It was always ah. ah, 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 ah. It was required that I really kind of use my full voice. So this is another building block, pitch is one. 
uh, open throated singing is one. Another example of building block when it comes to vocalizing is breathing, the way you breathe. This is something that we discovered a little bit early uh, later on. <clears throat> but as a vocalist, your body is your instrument. Um, obviously, where the vocal folds are is the um, is a very important aspect, uh, and and taking care of your voice is very important. But also, how do you breathe? And um, as I learned this, it made singing much more of an immersive process, uh, taking deep breaths through the nose and through the mouth, and opening up all your cavities. Your body is made up of multiple cavities or spaces where air can resonate. Um, when it resonates, it gives you the ability to use the full spectrum of your voice. So um, one of the cavities exists in your face. So taking a deep breath through your nose and keeping your face alert like this really helps kind of opening up those cavities uh, and letting the air resonate in those spaces. Another one is your chest. So taking a deep breath, um, using your diaphragm. And so there's a difference between singing like, ah, where all cavities are closed. The nasal cavity is closed. The face is, is not resonating. And the chest is also um, not really being uh, used to its fullest uh, ability. Whereas if I sing like this, ah, ah, you can obviously hear quite a difference in the resonance. Um, so these three things that I mentioned are three basic building blocks that come with being a singer. Um, these were instilled in me at a very early age. And obviously, as I grew up, I started to master things like pitch, you know, not losing a note, um, making sure that I always used my full voice and breathing techniques. I really internalized them to the point that it became intuitive. Now, moving on from that, uh, something that's Carnatic music specific, and I think really, really, truly exhibits that the importance of building blocks um, is the concept of raga in Carnatic music. So raga is, um, if I was just going to very basically define it, um, a very nuanced set of melodic vocabulary, uh, which is specific to each raga. There are countless ragas in the Carnatic music form, and each one of them is distinct and separate from another one. Uh, and the way these distinctions are formed is through the vocabulary of phrases that makes up said raga. So this all might sound a bit abstract, but I'll break it down, um, taking a specific ragam and, and kind of diving in. Um, one that uh, I've always loved is Karhara Priya. I sang a little bit of Navasiddhi Petalum before. So if you take that ragam and, and we're going to kind of look into what the vocabulary of it is, uh, so I said phrases. So in Araga, the building block is a phrase, right? Um, so here are some phrases in Karhara Priya. <laughs> There's one. So the second thing, the thing I just sang, took the first phrase and added something before it. These are all little phrases. So a phrase is just a... Uh, uh, it can be anything. It's a small unit. So everything I'm singing right now is what I'm drawing from is these small phrases and where you find these phrases, where you kind of develop your vocabulary is by learning compositions. Uh, a piece that I actually learned quite recently is Chakani Raja. Chakani Raja So within a composition, especially um, in Carnatic music, these compositions are so 
there's many, you know, and each composer has their own kind of stamp, but there is a well of these vocabulary. There's, there's so many different phrases that you can take and pluck from a song and really kind of think on. Now tying this back to the foundational phase um, and what I was talking about input and output, this is a very important uh, thing I realized when it came to understanding and grasping raga, internalizing these vocabulary um, and really kind of mastering uh, by listening, trying, learning new pieces. Once you've mastered the vocabulary of said raga, what you can do with it is almost, it's, it's boundless. There's so much that you can do with it. So this is, the this is an example of building blocks, how they're used in the context of Carnatic music. Um, around 2008, I started studying at Berkeley College of Music. So while I was there, uh, I really kind of, I had a goal in mind. I wanted to find and create my own sound for myself, a, a genre that I felt was unique to just myself. So um, it's a vast and very, very uh, complex process, you know, to, to come up with a genre that I felt like was my own it would take a lot of work. It would take a lot of soul searching. Um, but most importantly, it took me really kind of buckling down and learning the basics, you know, um, I knew what forms of music I loved. I knew I loved Carnatic music, R&B soul, hip hop. I loved rock, um, film music, Indian film music had always been a backbone to my creative kind of process. So how was I going to take all of this and, and turn it into my own thing? Um, so at Berkeley, uh, the, the breakdown of the steps kind of um, occurred randomly, but I can trace it back now. Uh, the first kind of thing that I really started digging into was songwriting. Um, was And within songwriting, there's the aspect of chords, um, which are basically a cluster of notes that when coming together, uh, they invoke a sense of emotion. An example of a chord here is a C major. F major seven. E flat major seven. C major seven. These are just different chords. It's just a group of notes that when you play them together, they sound the way. And there's a whole lot to music theory. I'm oversimplifying it now just because of time. Um, but, you know, learning how to put together chords, it's a very basic kind of characteristic of Western music, but learning that from the ground level, the base level and understanding it, that was a building block. Lyrics, you know, really studying how to songwrite and write lyrics. Um, was a big one. Like I said before, I very early on started asking kind of these vast questions of what I wanted uh, for myself, asking questions of what was going on around me, both on a very personal and existential level. Um, so how was I going to take all these thoughts and put it down into lyrics? So I started not relearning the English language, but really kind of looking back at the English language from this lens of um, poetry, um, how would I put these thoughts together in such a way that made sense and also went uh, and moved well with, with melodies. And um, an example of a song that I came up with much later is called California Air. Um, it was the, one of the first songs I actually wrote in its entirety and it kind of goes like this. Suburban sidewalk. A kiss on my cheek Dash a warm feeling Dash of what makes me weak So with that song, I started really grasping how I wanted to express myself. At that point in time, I was feeling very homesick. So I um, started putting that into play. How I wanted to take my Carnatic background and uh, have it intertwine with these Western forms of music and, and ideas. Um, and that's what really kind of consumed me while I was at Berkeley. When I was there, I really was consumed by this idea of, of making my own sound. So I really broke it down into its most basic units and started understanding those units. And I, that's how I moved. So 
few things to note about this. A few things to note about this stage uh, of building your framework. It's unglamorous, oftentimes. Sometimes it's not fun, um, but a key is that you have you have to fall in love with the process of what it, whatever you've dedicated yourself to. Um, you know, there's so many times in my journey with Carnatic music where these abstract concepts like uh, phrases in Araga or some of the more rhythmic uh, number-based concepts, they made absolutely no sense to me. And it would be frustrating because I knew I had this deep down, like I had this ability to express myself through this form, but some of the key elements that were required, uh, you know, understanding these elements were required to move forward with the form, they didn't make any sense. It seemed like it was a, um, a glacier that was, I was standing right. I couldn't get the bird's eye view of anything. So in those moments, you just got to chip away. Uh, I think that's the most important aspect of what I'm talking about today is that the hard work um, that you put in at this phase of, of, of really building your framework, building your skill sets, building your outlook on life, it takes it's a daily grind every single day. You got to get to it. And uh, even the days where it's really boring, frustrating, um, not making sense, uh, you just got to keep going. And as you do that, as you build a routine with your passion and as you build a strong relationship, a dedicated relationship with your passion and you chip away every day, you start to find that, yeah, you want to become maybe a very important in your field. Um, maybe you want to achieve this, that, and the third. But the true love, the true um, takeaway in being passionate about something and really following it is the day-to-day -day process, that process of getting better. You know, you just keep your head down and you work, work, work. One day you kind of look up and you see, wow, I can do this and I can really do it well. And that's the, the best feeling ever. Um, I want to just note that, I don't know if this is talked about often, but I think uh, a requirement for following your dreams is that you have to believe that you can and that you will master your craft. Um, it's, um, it's not some lofty goal that's away in the distance. You got to that's why the process of breaking it down into units, your dream, you got to break it down to simpler, smaller components that you can then logically go through and work towards. Um, it is entirely possible to master your craft and really become so well versed that you, you feel like you can do anything with it. Um, not only does this give you a sense of, uh, you know, not, not, not only does it give you a skill set in the in whatever your said passion is, what it also does, it gives you a deep sense of self-belief. Uh, the belief in oneself, the belief that, you know, using um, this craft that you've mastered or are mastering, you can unlock so many other portals and open up so many other doors. Um, <laughs> so now we've talked about the first phase, which is building a strong foundation. The next one is building your frameworks and acquiring your skill sets. I think the last thing that I'll talk about before we open up to questions is actualizing the dream. So you have the sparks that lead you to dive into your passions. You have the skill sets, vocabulary, and frameworks that, that you acquire through working at your passion day in and day out. Uh, now, how do you take the fire ability and preparation and put it to work? Um, and how do you further define your dreams and make them a reality? So this phase is interesting. I think uh, it requires bits and parts of, I mean, it definitely requires a, a very strong foundation and a very strong fr framework, but there's other smaller concepts that I've talked about that we can tie back here. I think a big one is, is knowing oneself, you know, um, the, fundamental anchor points that we talked about in the first part of today's talk, they will guide you your whole life. And uh, when you're first discovering your passion, when you're in that spark kind of phase, the anchor points almost act like invisible arrows. They'll kind of gently nudge you towards what um, you want to do, what makes you feel a deep sense of fire. Uh, but once you're kind of at the, once you've 
spent the time, worked at your passion and start developing your skill sets and feel like you're becoming a master of what you do, um, these fundamental anchor points become a vehicle. They start to set the context of what you want to do. Uh, you know, they provide you with your intention of how you want to impact the world. So just to touch on what my fundamental anchor points are, I have a few that have really stuck with me and I'll touch on just a couple of them. I believe that music can profoundly impact the human spirit. Uh, and I learned early on that I want to use it to help people around the world feel, heal, transcend, and spread love. So I realized this when I was a kid performing. Um, subconsciously, I could uh, feel a connection between myself and other people that were listening. Um, whether it was at someone's house and we were just at a family gathering or whether I was performing a concert, um, that connection with other human beings felt very palpable when I was singing. So from that point on, I realized that this beautiful art form called music can really go and, and, and um, change the way someone feels very profoundly. Uh, so I held on to that, that's one. Another thing is I believe vocal music is most powerfully communicated through a full-throated approach to singing. Um, this is something I already touched on before. Another one is um, I want the beauty that is my culture and heritage to live vibrantly in all manifestations of my music. And I wanna be an ambassador of what I believe my roots are. Um, again, this I, I spoke on a little bit before, but uh, I think you know, as I've grown older, these, this idea that I, I'm really proud of my roots, where I'm from, who I am, um, I want that to be front and center of everything I do because I believe one of my uh, mission statements is to inspire others, you know, whatever their background is, uh, to be unapolog unapologetically themselves, you know, um, and I think to really be yourself without um, any doubt uh, one of the most important aspects is really embracing one's roots and holding on to them with a deep sense of love. Um, and the final, I think, thing uh, guiding fundamental anchor point is I want all manifestations of my music and my art to be honest representations and reflections of who I am. And that ties into the last point uh, where with music, I feel like I have my a mode of communicating and I want to use it to show people who I am and in a vulnerable way and in a fearless way such that they feel that they can also be who they are without having to question themselves at all. So in the process of actualizing your dreams, right? So these are my fundamental kind of anchor points. I used those points to think about what I wanted to become, how I wanted to, music, uh, to take music and use it to impact the world. Uh, I think, I'm just thinking on this for a second, but I, I, I don't know how many of my dreams, what I've actualized now, I don't know how much of it I, I very consciously thought about when I was a kid, but as I grew older, and I really kind of dedicated myself to my craft, certain things started clicking. Um, with Carnatic music, you know, it has such a profound impact on me, my growth, my acceptance of myself. So um, a big dream that I had was obviously to perform at the highest level possible, but also just to communicate the message that Carnatic music is a very accessible form of music. I think oftentimes it's put in this box of, uh, you know, only meant for certain listeners or only certain groups of people will listen to it, only maybe older folks or whatever. And these are all misconceptions. And I wanted to break those. Um, that was a big dream of mine. And I feel like I'm in the process of actualizing it now. Uh, when I perform, it's always very heartening to see people from different backgrounds, age groups, a lot of younger folks coming to my Carnatic concerts and being very engaged with the music from start to finish. Uh, and I think this just goes to show that this form that I'm so proud of is truly accessible. And yes, it's complex. Yes, it's intricate. And there's many, many layers to it. And to be a practitioner of the form, it requires an insane amount of hard work. 
but I think in the same breath, because of how strong of a form it is and how dynamic of a form it is, um, it can really cut across. Uh, just to kind of like outline, I, I, I really love singing this thing called Kalpana Swaram. So that's taking Swarams and improvising with it, especially at a faster speed. Uh, let me think of a piece that. So there's just like a, a, a flash of, a, a, of an instance where I think Carnatic music is so accessible and so dynamic. Um, so that was one of my dreams to actualize uh, the fact that this form is, is, is very, very accessible, very dynamic, and I wanted to be an ambassador of that. Um, that's one. Another one is, uh, you know, never in my wildest dreams that I think I'd work with AR Sir um, and working with him from 2012 to now, starting with Adie. Uh, has been a dream come true. And I think within the context of Indian film music, I always, you know, I didn't know I was going to enter this field. It happened uh, pretty magically, serendipitously, but um, getting to really create my own voice in, in, in this industry and, ha and offer a different perspective, I, I think. When uh, Ariye came out, no one had ever heard anything like that in Tamar film music. And that speaks to the genius that is AR, sir. Um, but to be able to do a Thummer blues folk song um, was dream debut. And to take that and to build that from then and um, kind of continue this idea that I can offer a different perspective through my singing in for films. Um, and that extends to my live shows where we kind of are so free, you know, when we perform and we see how people react to that. These are all dreams of mine that I've, um, you know, at a gut level felt for a very long time and are, have actualized in the last, I would say, four to five years. Um, so just to kind of wrap up and then we can go into questions. Uh, I think, and to tie everything together, the foundation is very, very important. You know, the foundation phase, the exploratory phase, uh, finding out who you are, what exists at your core, what really drives you, what your conviction is, um, is one of the most important things you can do. I think that is the starting point. Without that, um, without really doing the, the necessary soul searching to think about what you want your purpose to be, um, there'll be a sense of emptiness that settles in, you know? So dude, that's the first level of hard work is, is finding yourself, you know? And it's a lifelong process. There's by no stretch or any of these things, things that happen just over a course of two years or you first found your, like spend two years building foundation, then you spend two years building your framework, then you spend four years uh, uh, bringing your dreams to life. That's not how it works. These all kind of, are constantly moving in and out of one another. And they're all processes that are constantly evolving, you know? So the foundational phase, like I said, for me, even to this day, it applies. I'm always adding new things to my foundation. And like about five years ago, I started sketching and I do these sketch pieces of sketch art. Here's one right here. And they're really kind of random, but it was a new skill set I wanted to acquire and a new passion I found. So I really kind of dove into it and that's actually helped my other creative pursuits. So that's the foundation bit. Now with the framework is just really slogging it out every single day. The things that you discover that you're passionate about in the first kind of, when you're building your foundation, finding those sparks, you know, taking the time and really respecting the form that you are obsessing over, you know, and giving yourself to it. And the actualizing of the dreams, you know, set your intention. 
realize what you want your impact to be outside of just your own personal dreams of wanting to get to a certain place in whatever your career path might be. How do you want to impact the world around you? You know, what do you want your significance to be um, outside of just yourself? I think it's very important, especially in this day and age. Um, what do you want to change about the world? What do you want to, how are you going to add beauty to it? How are you going to add significance to it? You know, thinking about those things. Um, and I think that comes with empathy, you know, caring about the people around you, feeling a true sense of love um, and unapologetically being yourself. I think that's the ultimate goal is you know, through all these things, you know, we, we think there are definitely certain material things we want in life. There are certain goals that we aspire towards. Um, but I think the greatest goal is to understand oneself and to be oneself fearlessly without having to ever apologize for who you are. Um, and, you know, you build yourself and you build your passion and you give yourself to your passion in such a way that you can really be proud of what you're doing. Uh, I want to just close out by saying this time right now, um, we're still here on, I'm in California right now, and we're still on lockdown. I know a lot of people are spending a lot of time, um, you know, indoors. It's, there's a silver lining of this. And I think the silver lining is, especially in this day and age where technology is so present, right? It's, the best time to discover what you want to do, what you want to create. Um, I'll throw out another cliche, but the future is really, you know, dependent on younger folks. I was going to say us younger folks, but I'm now 30 years old, so <laughs> I'm not going to put myself in that category. But uh, younger folks really kind of thinking about, you know, what makes me feel deeply how am I going to give back to that thing that makes me feel deeply? Um, and again, I know I've talked a lot about music, especially about Carnatic music today, but it can be anything, you know, mathematics, neuroscience, architecture, um, space. You know, that's a whole other frontier that is very exciting. Music, visual arts, um, medicine, engineering, you know, so many different things. Uh, but you know, once you identify, how are you going to give yourself to it? And this is the time to explore. You have the time to explore. You also have the time to really work harder than you've ever worked before. Um, and there's a saying, work hard, play hard. And I think that's a very, I don't really agree with that. I think if you're working hard, you're probably also playing hard because if you're working hard at something that you really love, it doesn't feel like work. It, 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 it just feels like you are deeply entrenched in your purpose. Um, when I signed on to today's uh, call under the Pushpalata, uh, on the emblem, I saw something that said, love, learn, lead. And I think that's the key. I think, um, you know, I say something, I say all love, no hate a lot. I think love, love is such a vast emotion, but I think ultimately it is something that pushes us to strive to be better human beings, uh, to care for one another and to spread true positivity. Um, so love I think is the foundation, those sparks. To learn is the framework, you know, learn, the units, learn the vocabulary, take the time to really understand your form and everything that's within it. Um, and to lead, I think the best way of leadership is to dream a future that is beautiful and exciting and work tire tirelessly to bring that dream to life. And with that, uh, uh, I'll finish up and we can start questions. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful speech and you have given a lot of knowledge regarding the music. Thank you so much, sir. And here we have a few questions from our students. Sure, sure. 
Do you dream to win a Grammy? Funny story. Uh, what, before I started at Berkeley, so I graduated high school 12th in 2008, started later that year. I went to Berkeley College of Music in 2008. Um, so my family unit is very strong. They've always been huge supporters, not just supporters, they've always pushed me. My mom's my guru, my dad is very deeply involved in my career. My sister is a co-collaborator of mine. So before I went to college, we made this, we had this long conversation and said that by the time I finished my first year at Berkeley, I should win a Grammy, um, which now thinking back on it was completely unrealistic, um, but it was a good kind of goal, I guess, to set. Um, now, I think my goals have somewhat changed in that, you know, they say um, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Uh, I think that has definitely rung true in my life because yeah, when I started college, I had this goal of wanting to win a Grammy, but by the time I finished college, 2012, I had recorded my first song with Ramansar. And that was not something I thought about. You know, I was thinking Grammy, but something else, another whole world opened up for me, um, which then has given me this beautiful career. So um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to win a Grammy. I'd love to, I, I think it'd be amazing, but I'm more, what, what my focus is, is creating music. I'm working on my second album right now, actually. I've been working on it during lockdown. Um, my, my biggest goal is creating music that travels the whole world that impacts people around the world. If as a byproduct of that, if a Grammy comes, then yeah, obviously I'll be happy. But uh, it's not, I'm not gonna say that's what I, I don't think the destination is that important. That was nice, sir. that was nice. And uh, which song inspires you the most? Can you sing it for us? Sure. Uh, there's so many songs uh, to pinpoint just one. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, there's a few. Uh, there's one Carnatic song that has, is always really close to my heart. It's a Muthuswami Dikshita Kriti in Puri Kalyani called Meenakshi Memodam. I'll sing a little bit of it. Me nakshi me mudam de ki me nakshi me mudam de ki me there's one um then uh another song that inspires me i think you know this um I sing it at all my shows, but Nilak uh, Aigra, there's one that like, if I ever feel down or if I ever like just kind of uh, need a place of peace, that's the song I listen to. I listen to both uh, the version of Harini singing and Hari Haransar singing it. Um, it's one of my favorite compositions. I'll sing a couple lines. Nilak Aigra de Neram te girade yarum rasika villaye in the Kangal matum ne kanum tendrel pogindade sole sirikindade yarum sugika villaye in the Kaigal matum ne tindum. Katrivi sum veil kayum kayum Adil matram yedum milaye Avanum manum namai vara sulum Andavatu oya vilayil del rumvanil Nila kai giradi. Fabulous, fabulous. It was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, we have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. And if you got a chance to interview a person, whom would you choose? It's a good one. Um, hmm. I think uh, one person I definitely want to interview 
this is dead or alive, right? Does like either is okay? They can be have have passed away. Right? Saint Yagaraj, that's one person I definitely would want to interview. His uh, just what he contributed to Carnatic music, just like such a vast uh, um, group of songs, There's, and they all kind of uh, his his compositions really kind of travel the spectrum of of tempo of different kind of emotions. So I think that, yeah, him, him mainly, I think there'd be a bit of a, I don't know what language he spoke actually, but we'd figure it out. We have Google Translate now. So. Yeah. And uh, what are the, some other things which interest you other than music? Um, so many things. Uh, when I was in high school, I was really into chemistry. Uh, that's a subject that I was very, you know, uh, at first reluctantly passionate about, but then once I got into it, I was like, oh, this is really cool stuff. Um, that's one thing. Uh, I was talking about sketching before. Uh, that's something I've gotten into in like last, probably like since 2014. So like six years. Um, and that allows me just another creative outlet outside of music, which is important. I love reading. Um, uh, I just started reading Steve Jobs' biography. That's what I'm reading right now. Um, other authors I really like are, I like Murakami books a lot. Uh, and then the book, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand is one of my favorites. So reading, um, obviously films. I love watching movies. Uh, and also kind of like breaking them down. I guess like some of my favorite films are, are more kind of art house movies, art movies, but I love the whole spectrum um, and nature, I think. And I guess nature is something we should all, that's something I've really re realized through this period, these last six, seven months is uh, because life is always moving at such a hectic pace or you know, you're kind of going from one place to another, uh, you fail to realize the beauty that exists around you. Um, and that's a, a big thing that I've taken away, you know, like, and the other day I was sitting in the back, my backyard, just listening to like the wind and, you know, stuff like that, that we don't normally do. I think those things can actually be very obviously inspiring and also um, calming, but also give you ideas of, uh, it's great, great time to think about what you want to do and what you want to create or, or whatever. So, yeah. That was wonderful, sir. And a few more questions. Uh, uh, how will you define success? Um, hmm, that's defining it is quite hard. I think you internally know when you feel it, you know, when you're like, oh, this is a moment that I can definitely feel like I've succeeded, but defining it is hard. I think, um, well, I'll say this, like whatever, uh, the journey is, whatever your area of, of, of passion is the, it's a lifelong thing. You know, and these, the journey will be made up of many small, small successes. I don't know that there is one big ultimate success. Like, okay, now I am successful. I don't know. Cause even to this day, like I, you know, I've done decently well for myself, but there's still, I feel like I've only achieved 2% of what I want to achieve, you know? Um, so, but I think defining success is uh, kind of what I talked about today, finding your passion, finding what you really love you know, um, and dedicating yourself to it. I think that is like the first level of success, dedicating oneself to it. Then from that process, you're going to achieve so many different things or find yourself in many different spaces that maybe you had never imagined before. Um, I guess uh, those different points, you know, and I, I won't say winning an award or whatever is success. I think creating something, that's what I think success is. Creating something that you're very proud of, that you can really like say, I made this, this is, and creating something that impacts the world around you more than just yourself, not just for selfish gains, but something that actually gives other people they can, uh, something they can hold on to and, and, and really love as well. I think that's what success is. That was nice, sir. As a last request, uh, many students are asking uh, your favorite song. And please, my we have a few lines. My favorite song, as in like yeah. songs I've sung or just any song? Uh, yeah, 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 any song, any song. Um, 
I'll finish up with two songs, right? Um, the first one is this R&B soul song. It's called Change Is Gonna Come. It's in English by this, uh, it's from, I think, like the 60s. Uh, artist, is his name is Sam Cooke. He's a legendary soul singer uh, from the States. So I'll sing a little bit of that. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Did a little bit of that song. So, um, it's a song about change. It's a song about believing that... Uh, change is not uh impossible that it's very very much a possible thing and it's important so that's the, that did that uh then um so last year i composed songs for this film Bono Cortoto, and that was a big pivotal kind of step in my career in my life so there's a song from that movie called yen uir kate so i'll sing a little bit of that kandama, kandama solvaya. Yen vasamun karam taraya ha kan mudiyam min nidum kadirai yen ulle ulir vadiyar solvai solvai ha kannamma kannamma nanya Thank you so much, sir. Just a minute. Um, as a student request, uh, since uh, it is going on YouTube Live, uh, they are asking uh, um, uh, 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 some more movie songs, if you please. <laughs> okay, so we'll finish up with one last song, okay? Uh, I'll sing... Uh, like uh, Karnana Kanne song. That's the one they want? Okay, give me <laughs> <laughs> one second. Kanne, 
புதை மணலில் விழுந்து புதை நிறவே இருந்தேன் குறுநகையே இருந்தேன் மீட்டா என்னை விண்ணோடும் மண்ணோடும் வாடும் பேரும் ஊஞ்சல் மனதோரம் கண்பட்டு நூல் விட்டு போகும் என ஏதோ பயம் கூடும் மயில் ஒன்றை பார்க்கிறேன் மழையாகி ஆடினேன் இந்த உற்சாகம் போதும் சாக தோன்றும் இதேவி நாடி கண்ணான கண்ணே Kannana, kanne. That was amazing, sir. That was amazing. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all um, so much. I hope you guys enjoyed the session today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are really uh, energized by your uh, presence and enthusiasm on behalf of Pushpalada Schools and Pushpalada Vidya Mandar. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, spending a valuable time with us. Thank you. um uh, we and uh, we are sure to follow the ideas of uh, music life uh, and how to achieve the unatt- unattainable goals shared by you on this occasion um thank you so much sir thank you thanks a lot thank you thank you everyone have a great great day no evening uh and yeah keep in mind you know foundation build a framework and dream up whatever you want to dream up and go achieve it peace thank you so thank you all you are watching pushpalata learn at live channel uh, reflection series and if you uh, like this video just give a thumbs up and subscribe to pushpalata learn at live channel and this is sriram and mr jude signing off take care bye bye and meet you in the next series bye